Tonight's lecture, okay, first part of path analysis, estimation, and fit indices. And we're actually going to do estimation first as our first topic. And this is really going to get us into writing models. So we're going to kind of build this structure of specify or build a model, analyze the model, summarize the model, diagram the model. Okay, so it's kind of a four-step process when it comes to the code so that you can use that same pattern pretty much consistently, maybe not for item response theory, but um, that set of steps will work for you on all these different model types. But first, let's talk a little bit about estimation. So this is kind of going to round out a little bit of our terminology section as well. And so estimation is the underlying math that goes on behind the scenes, which is where the numbers come from. So um, what's happening to get to the summary output. There are a couple of very common types of estimation. One of them hopefully will be familiar because we use it for factor analysis, but maximum likelihood. It's the most popular estimation. I don't think I have ever used anything else, but there are a couple of other ones, such as asymptotically distribution free. There's actually another name for this that's also abbreviated ADF, and I have it in a couple slides. It's just jumped out of my head right now. Unweighted least squares, which is admittedly also popular, or weighted least squares, two-stage least squares, generalized least squares. There's like a bunch of different least squares options. But we're going to focus on maximum likelihood because it is the most common. And the way the maximum likelihood works, without getting like knee deep in the math, is that the estimates that it provides are ones that maximize the likelihood. So that's where the name comes from, that the data were drawn from the population. So it estimates a bunch with some iterations, a bunch of different parameters and picks the most probable one. So structural equation models are not a closed form solution right? in the sense that a linear regression has one and only one answer. Okay, these are estimated solutions. And if you remember, we talked about last week that one of the issues that you have is that you have to have one and only one answer, right? So matrices to be invertible, all that kind of stuff. Um, but with maximum likelihood, what we're doing is picking the most likely answer. So there's only one answer, but we're picking the most probable estimate that fits that answer. It's considered a normal theory method, which means that the data should have multivariate normality. And that means across all the different combinations of the variables. And we talked about in data screening how to check for that. That gets tricky when you use categorical variables. So there are different times and places you can use um, non-continuous data. And we'll kind of introduce those. But generally, if you have some sort of dichotomous or binary variable where you have two outcomes, you can use that pretty easily. If you have three or more outcomes, you have to basically dummy code them to include them. And then if your dependent variable is going to be like sort of a binary outcome, you should probably use a different type of math. Okay. So there are ways to uh, adjust for having uh, non-continuous data because multivariate normality is really about continuous data. So check that assumption. Okay. The other types of estimators we're going to go over may work better for non-normal, very skewed data um, that are in endogenous variables. So it's exogenous, not so much of a problem, but it's endogenous when we're being predicted. The, variable, the arrow is going in. That's when it becomes a bit trickier. It's also considered a full information method, okay, meaning the estimates are all calculated at the same time. Partial information methods calculate part of the estimates and then use those as starting points for the rest of the estimates. Okay. Full instrument, there's no real like bonus for one or the other. It's partial information methods are a little bit easier when they're very complex because you're only estimating part of the model at once. But if you get that wrong, the whole rest of the thing can go sideways. So a lot of people like full information methods because they're all estimated kind of together at once. Okay. Doesn't mean it can't go sideways. It still can. <laughs> So we'll talk about Haywood cases some more today. And what we'll end up with is called the FML, which makes me laugh a lot every time I see it because of its acronym use, right? 
but that is the fit function for maximum likelihood, so maximum, you know, the minimum fit statistic, uh, which is this idea that we are taking, it's an analysis of covariances we talked about before, and we're taking the, the sample covariance matrix and we're trying to reproduce it with our model. So we have our estimated covariances from the model, the picture that you're drawing, the actual covariances, and you just try to see if those match. And we're trying to find the best fit possible. So maximum likelihood maximizes the fit between our covariances, so the data is from that model picture. And so we want our fit function to be high if we're measuring goodness of fit, right? Because we want the match, the overlap to be high. So the sample covariances match the estimated covariances. We talked about this with EFA as well. It's the same principle. Low if we're measuring residuals, because okay? that would be a mismatch to, of the sample to the estimated covariances. So essentially we take those two matrices and we just try to see, essentially calculate a correlation between them almost. It's not quite how that works, but um, we'll talk about fit indices on steroids in the next class. <clears throat> and so this is an iterative process. It's usually very fast though, unless you just have extremely large data sets um, to find, you know, tweak until it finds the, the best solution. And what Levon does for you is it calculates a possible starting solution. Um, I don't think that this is very complex or um, informative is not the right word here. It's not magic behind the scenes. I think it starts with one on all of them, if I remember correctly, um, or zero, ones and zeros. So it, it picks this possible start solution. And for really complicated models, you can actually tell it a solution, like a, a, a sample set of starts. And so when I first learned structural equation modeling, I learned it on Lizerol, which has not changed since before I was in graduate school, so many, many moons ago. And um, it's still around. You had to provide it sometime a lot more often than normal start solutions because it would just crash constantly. Or I was not very good at it, or both. Um, some of the other popular programs, like M+, uh, are very good at picking start solutions. I have never had to give a start solution in Lebon. But that is an option you can do, is give it a place to start iterating. Then it starts running several times and creates the sort of best fit function or the largest match between the covariance matrices. And start values are usually generated by the computer. You can enter them if you're having problems converging on a solution. Generally this is not where your problem lies. It's usually a problem with a specific variance, for example, but it does happen. And um, going back to this idea, the the nice thing about Levon is it really is very efficient at this process. Okay, so it iterates really pretty quickly, and if it's going to crash, it's fast. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. The only time I've had it run what I would consider slowly is when I had models with um, 20,000 people in them. Okay, and that just is a lot of people, so it takes a little while to run. Okay. Another bonus to maximum likelihood, and I think this is pretty important, is that it is scale-free. Okay. So scale-free, some of the other estimating functions assume certain types of scales or assume they're all in the same scale. So you can't use something like a 1 to 5 and then income together, because that would be very pretty different scales, but maximum likelihood is scale-free, so it doesn't really matter what the data is scaled to. Okay. Invariant meaning if you have different scales of the data, which should give you the same solution. Okay. So if I change the scale with a linear transform, the model should return the same answer. Okay, that's just like a regression. Okay. It does assume unstandardized start variables, because if you were to have standardized variables and then run the standardized solution, which we'll talk about a little bit more today, um, you would have double standardization, which is just a little weird. Okay, so it does assume that these variables are unstandardized to then be able to scale them appropriately. Okay. We talked about the scaling issue as part of identification, right? and this is part of that. 
So it's going to scale those variables to create these standardized solutions. So if they're already standardized, it's a little, a little weird. I mean, it'll let you do it, but the assumption is that it's not. And the interpretation of the estimates are, are just, we've kind of covered this, but I just want to reiterate that a loading is kind of, or a path coefficient, if we're thinking about confirmatory factor analysis, or just like regression, or uh, loading coefficients. A covariance or a correlation is just how much these two items vary together. We talked a little bit about how covariance is difficult to interpret, so we'd want the standardized solution there. And the error variances are residuals. It's how much variance is not accounted for by the model. So you want this to be small. And then the variances on exogenous variables are just how much variance that variable has, which is different from error variance. And then we've got our squared multiple correlations that are the variance accounted for in an endogenous variable. So it's kind of the opposite of the error variance. So if error variance is small, SMC tends to be large. And we'll see this in a section called R square in the output. So let's cover just a little bit of the other methods of sung ML's praises. But if you have continuous variables, mostly continuous, and a normal distribution, you could use generalized least squares, okay? unweighted least squares, fully weighted least squares, and then we talked on the first slide about two-stage least squares, but I have some notes on these three. Okay. So for generalized least squares, the pros is that it is also scale-free, and that's really pretty important. Okay. It is actually computationally faster than an iterative process. The cons are that it's really actually not very common anymore. And if this runs, maximum likelihood tends to also run. So there's no real advantage other than time, maybe. Unweighted least squares pros is that it does not require positive definite matrix, which is really good if your correlations between latents or your correlations between two variables is very high. That can cause you problems with a definite matrix. So you can try unweighted least squares to kind of get around that. It does tend to provide robust initial estimates that then you can use in a maximum likelihood estimator. Its cons are that it's not scale free. And it does not run very fast. I feel like this is slowly becoming less of a problem with the computational advances in the literature. So efficiency may not be quite as important anymore. Okay. And so if you're going to do an unweighted least squares, you do have to scale the variables to be in the same scale. Okay. That doesn't mean standardize them, like a z-score. That means like if you have a 1 to 5 and a 1 to 1,000, you have to basically get them down to all 1 to 5. Now, if I have non-normal data, what can I do? Well, the problem with running it on non-normal data and maximum likelihood is that your and estimates could be accurate, um, but the standard errors are pretty large because it's you no know, skewed data, um, which causes problem where model fit tends to be overestimated. You would think this would be the other way around, but model fit tends to, it tends to be too nice to you. And so you have a model that fits well, but the standard errors are really large, and that's a little suspicious. And you always have to remember that standard errors are in the scale of the data. So, you know, generally, if you're running a 1 to 5 scale, you'll get a standard error of like 0.01 or something. Um, but if you're using income, those numbers will be much larger. So when you talk about standard errors being large, you have to keep in mind the scale of the data. And so what, what most people do all the time, and not just when normality is violated, it's use a corrected normal method. Okay. And this is a maximum likelihood with an adjustment on the standard errors. Okay, so using a robust standard error. I don't know when you wouldn't want to use a robust standard error. Right? It's robust, meaning that it can be, it can handle normal data or not normal data, who cares? So generally this is what people do all the time. And you'll see this sometimes labeled as the satora bentler statistic, which adjusts the chi-square based on the amount of skew. Okay, this chi-square is our minimum fit statistic, which we'll get to next time.
Um, it's considered a corrected model statistic. There's one more, the Ewan, I don't know why it's not in here, but the Ewan Bentler statistic is also another option. And I think this is the default already in Levon. All right, so asymptotically distribution free also works for non-normal data. Some time arbitrary, that's what it was. Some books call this arbitrary distribution free. And what happens is it estimates the amount of skew in the data to generate a model. Okay, but I have never had these work for me. I mean, they just don't have bad data. That would be beautiful, right? I've had bad data. Um, I've never had them really converge well in a way that was better than maximum likelihood. But what's happening is it's adding an extra layer of parameters to estimate because it's also estimating the skew and kurtosis to help generate the model. And so sometimes that's too many parameters and they just don't converge. And by converge, I mean they don't iterate well enough to provide an accurate solution. <clears throat> so those are our general estimation types you'll see. When we get to item response theory, we'll talk about a couple of other ones that are specific to that analysis um, because the, the math for that is pretty different. And we're going to talk about these errors a lot because they happen a lot, I feel like. And um, these are when you get an inadmissible solution. And this is why I always tell people to run those kind of steps. Build the model, analyze the model, summarize the model, diagram the model. Because if you get to running these too quickly, because it's so easy to do an R, like shift, enter, 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 right? Um, you can miss the warnings that it gives you. They pop up in blue if you're using the kind of white background and they, they occur in different times and in different ways and so uh, we'll look at when those happen but um, you can easily get what's considered an inadmissible solution okay? which means it gives you numbers and there's this temptation to think like oh the program ran and it gave me numbers it must be right. Okay? That's not true. I there are days when I wish it wouldn't spit out answers, and I've talked to um, the guys who wrote that, but it makes sense to me why it does, because they're essentially giving you, like, maybe if you try different start parameters, this might work. So um, always check for inadmissible solutions. And you can see those when you have Haywood cases specifically, where the parameter estimates are illogical. Now, when parameter estimates are zero, it's hard to know if that's illogical. So generally, you see this when they're way too large. Okay, if you have a one to five scale, having a, uh, a regression coefficient of seven makes no possible sense, right? Because the slope cannot be that high because it ranges from one to five. It can't, it can't be that crazy. Um, or 4,000, like it just, when the numbers don't make a lot of sense, okay. uh, the standard errors, also being very large. So if you get a standard error of like 9,000 on a one to five scale, that's really wrong. Uh, a super big problem is when you have negative uh, variance estimates and you send the thinking like variance, the formula for variance is squared. There's no possible way that it could estimate a negative number, but it does and it'll happen. And I have some examples specifically set to do that. And this happens when the covariance matrix is a little odd, is what I would say. Like there are some sort of um, really large values when everything else is small or the reverse or kind of like everything's positive and a couple of them are negative and the model just doesn't quite fit. Um, correlations are too high. So the values are all like they all vary together per nearly perfectly. There's a couple of ways this can happen. And sometimes there's just no good answer. It just doesn't work. <laughs> and you get one and you don't know why. Okay, we'll talk about how to fix them. Okay. Um, and that, just a note, it's just variance. Covariance can be negative. Uh, these are the error variances that are negative. Okay. Or you get a correlation estimate over one. Okay, correlations can be bigger than one. So that's a problem. So why do these happen just practically? Okay, that might be a specification error. Remember, by specification we mean like the way you've drawn the model. 
It could be a non-identified model. You don't have enough degrees of freedom on all parts of the model. It could be an outlier or multiple outliers with a smaller sample size. As sample size increases, this becomes less problematic. Or it's a small sample just in general, and it's really hard to estimate um, the data. So while the degrees of freedom for the model are based on parameters, right, small samples are still very, they can be pretty variable. Very variable? It doesn't work. They can be variable. <laughs> it becomes hard to predict all that variance. If you only have two indicates, indicates two indicators per latent, or two squares, the measured variables per latent, the circle variable, um, and you don't identify the model correctly, it will go bunk. Okay, it will not run. But more is always better. For latent variables, it's always better to have multiples. And I do see people build models sometimes where there's one indicator for a latent variable. Don't do that. That's just silly. Because in that point, you're just using that measured variable twice. So they need at least two squares per bubble, okay. and preferably more than two. Or bad start values. But bad start values tend to start higher up, usually in the non-identification section. And very low or very high correlations. Sometimes this is called imperial, empirical under-identification. So you'll have bad models when there are nothing is correlated. It's hard to predict variance that isn't there, right? Or models that have nearly perfect correlations because it's hard to estimate. So when the numbers get that close to one, the correlation between measured variables, when they're that high, it's very difficult to estimate them right on that spot, right? Because they're so close to the top. And that's when you'll get um, Haywood cases where the correlation's over one. And it won't always happen on the variable itself, the measured variable. It'll often happen up at the latent variable. Okay. And I have an example where we'll have that happen. So that's, uh, ooh, no, estimation. It's estimation. Let's write some models now. Okay. So we're going to start with path models because they are basically regression on regression. Okay. And it allows you to start thinking about basically running multiple regressions at once. Okay. So a quick reminder, since we've all had a turkey day off, circles on our path diagrams are our unobserved or latent variables. Okay. Error, error terms are shown as a double-headed horseshoe in Levon's pictures, um, but you'll often sometimes see them represented as circles in other diagram versions. Our squares are our manifest, our measured, our observed variables. And then you might actually also see triangles. And we'll see triangles later in the semester where it represents the intercept. Okay. So certain types of models use these, mostly multi-group models. So what's a path model specifically? And I would argue, although some people disagree, but it's a model with only manifest variables. So it's only squares. And path models are part of a fully structural model that we'll get to in a couple of weeks. Um, and, and it just allows you to sort of learn some of the skill sets before we get into latent variables. So we're going to models with all squares. The straight arrows are our causal or directional arrows. So we have exogenous variables, the, vari the arrows leaving that variable, predicting our endogenous or dependent variables. In our non-standardized solutions, these are our B values in regression, our slopes. In a standardized solution, that's beta. The interpretation is just like regression. As X goes up, Y goes up B points. If it's negative, as X goes up, Y goes down B points. Our curved aerials are non-directional, so the non-standardized version of this is covariance. And the standardized version of that is correlation. So just a little bit of a reminder of when we start looking at these pictures, keep these things in mind. All right, so some rules. All endogenous variables will get an error term. Levon will do this naturally for you, because okay, those are our y variables. All exogenous variables will have a variance. And I think it's 
useful to keep keep that distinction in mind, but know that in the output it labels them all as variants. Okay. Some of them get a dot in front, and that's how you know which ones are error terms. And then in bold, because this always surprises people, all exogenous only variables are automatically correlated by Levon. And we will see that in just a minute. <laughs> this is good for models where that's assumed, like in a confirmatory factor analysis, that's normal. In a path model, I think it just tends to surprise people because you don't expect it to do this. Okay, but it does. All exogenous variables get um, a correlation between their variances. All right. So we've been talking a lot about like the standardized solution and the regular solution. So why should I use the standardized solution as we start to look at these tonight? And for me, this is just a comparison point. So I can compare these coefficients and say this one is the strongest. Because in the unstandardized solution, they're in the scale of the data. In the standardized solution, they're basically z-scores. They can go over one on, on these types of models. So it just allows me to say, well, this one's the biggest out of all of these. Also allows me to compare them across models if I want. And for covariances, this really solves the problem of interpretation because covariance is much harder to interpret than correlation. And for in a couple weeks when we do CFA, it matches actually how EFA looks. So we'll come back to that point. For unstandardized solutions, I use those when I'm trying to interpret. So if I'm trying to estimate some future value, uh, you should do that in the scale of the data. And that makes a lot of sense. <laughs> and interpreting those path coefficients. So it's easier for me to say something like, for every one uh, study session you attend, you get 0.05 grade points. Okay. So this is a project I did many moons ago where we were looking at these like undergraduate study sessions. And we were able to tell them, if you go to five study sessions, that's equivalent, or it was 10, sorry. You go to 10 study sessions, that's equivalent to half a letter grade. Okay. That's a much better sell than being like, well, if you go to a standard deviation of study sessions, like that doesn't mean anything to people, right? So in the scale of the data, helps us understand. Okay. And that's really like the only reason why I use the unstandardized solution. All right, let's code. Yeah. So install Levon. Okay, Levon stands for latent variable analysis. So that's why the, the acronym. Install SimPlot because it's fantastic. Such a great plotting package that will help us make pictures. So get those bad boys installed. And then let's think about the syntax. So to specify a model, we have to write it out in essentially text. It's very similar to thinking about how you write formulas for regression with some new rules. Um, so the cheat sheet guide on Canvas. And we're going to define ourselves a model. Here's the best practice. Name that model something like name.model, where name is the description of the model you're building. And I'm going to try to use this throughout the semester. So like if I did a model on my study sessions, I'd do study.model. And then I'd have things like study.data. And you'll see why, because we'll have a bunch of outputs here in a minute. A single tilde indicates a regression, just like using uh, LM and R. So Y is predicted by X, so Y tilde X. Okay, so endogenous tilde exogenous. Two of them indicate a covariance or correlation. So here's the fun part. You can correlate two variables. If you correlate them, you're essentially correlating their variances or their error terms. It kind of Depends on if they're endogenous or exogenous, or you can correlate a variable with itself, which seems a little weird until you realize this is how you set a variance. So a variable correlated with itself turns out to be the variance in the solution. So if your variance is acting like a spoiled child, <laughs> uh, uh, you can tell it what to do. This also allows you to turn things on and off. So I can actually set the variance to a variable to zero. Don't do this. The model will be very unhappy with you, but 
you can make a negative area variance go away by setting it to a fixed value. And then an equals tilde indicates a latent variable. So we're you know, approximating building this latent variable. So then it would be latent variable equals tilde measured variables. And we'll do that one with our CFA section. Now, it will automatically add that error term for us, so you don't have to think about it. It just does it, which is cool. It does automatically constrain pass on latent variables to one. That's a one, not an L. So it creates a marker variable solution automatically. So we talked about that with scaling and identification. If you turn on the standardized solution, you'll see the marker variable or the latent variable solution. So I don't see any reason to change this. Specific models require other things, but there's no reason to mess with this uh, default option except in those cases because I would rather be able to see both solutions. Okay, if you set it to the latent variable solution, you can't see the other one. So, might as well see both. And then back to this point again, it automatically adds this covariance between all exogenous variables. Okay, this will but you will have this issue where you forget this. So I've got it in here twice <laughs> on purpose. All right, that is useful for analyses we get to later, but I always bring it up on path models because you don't think about it and um, it is automatic. All right, and it's unexpected usually. Okay, let me see if I can make the text just a little larger. There we go. All right, so I have some evaluation data, uh, like end of year teacher evaluation data. So I've imported that, I've called it eval.data. And what I want to do is build this picture. So this is a simple diagram. They're all squares, so these are all measured variables. And I've got a question about the lectures or the the course itself or the course you know is clear and organized so students rate this one to five or one is i hate everything you suck and five is uh yay it was great okay. and then i also have a question this is a course i wanted to take which i used to teach undergraduate statistics and i never won any um parties this way no one wants to take undergraduate statistics um and we're going to use both of those as exogenous variables to predict this fair grading. Okay. So fair grading, the grading was fair, basically. So generally, if people think things are clear and organized, they understand the grading. So this would be positive. If you, this is a course you didn't want to take, this could be positive. Like, well, at least the grading was fair. It could be negative, meaning I hated this course. None of the grading is fair. Or it could be zero. And we're using also a course I wanted to take to predict their overall score. Okay, the question on the overall question is like really awful. It's like, uh, this course is in the top 20% of courses I've ever taken, which if you're teaching a required lower level course is like <laughs> a useless question. Um, but you know, this course was wonderful and great. So if you don't want to take the course, this tends to be pretty um, positively correlated because if you want to take the course you tend to think it's really good unless it was just awful right but if you didn't want to take the course you definitely don't think it's in the top 20 percent of courses you've ever taken but maybe it's also influenced by the grading well I didn't really want to take this because why do I got to take this but at least the grading was fair and so that's how I'd read this so these two are predicting fair grading and then these two are predicting overall evaluation Normally to do this, I would have to maybe run five or six models, regression models. So let's estimate our degrees of freedom and practice a skill we learned last week. Okay. There are 10 possible parameters because we have four squares. So one, two, three, four. Okay. Remember it's P times P plus one divided by two. Okay. So four times five divided by two is 10. What parameters are estimated? So before I show you the answer, let's back up and think. So we've got one, two, three, four regression coefficients, two endogenous variant, uh, error variances, two regular error variances, eight 
And then that magic wand that people forget because it's not really clear this is supposed to happen, but this correlation between the exogenous variables. So four regressions, two error variances, two regular variances, and one covariance. Which means our degrees of freedom should be, that is wrong. <laughs> 10 minus 9 equals 1. <laughs> Flipped those. Apologies. So we have 9 estimated minus you know, minus 10, there's one degree of freedom. Okay. So if I've done this correct, which I clearly haven't um, on the slide, you know, we should have an identified model, right? <clears throat> an over-identified model, because degrees of freedom are greater than zero. All right, so let's see if we can do that. So how do I do this? How do I convert, mm, sorry, how do I convert the square diagram into the written out Levon code? I tend to start at the very end of the train of a path model. Path models tend to be like X predicts Y, which predicts Z, which predicts Q. Okay. So I always start at the end and work my way backwards. Okay. I may not have done this on the slide, but um, what I want to do is question one here has arrows coming into it. So that makes it a Y variable. So it goes on the left. So I'm going to say question one. I'm just going to type here. So I'm not going to show you the bottom just yet. Let's do notepad. Okay. So side by side, come over here. Oh, well now we can see it at the bottom. But um, what I was doing, if you don't see the bottom, okay, here, there we go. Okay, so we've got question one, is predicted by, so a tilde, and what's coming into it? Well, question four is coming into it, right? and question 12. And so you could put those on separate lines. You could do question one, tilde, question four, enter. Question one, tilde, question 12, enter. But Levon interprets that as this pattern. Okay, it's question one and question four, predicting arrows into, I'm sorry, question 12 and question four, arrows coming into question one. Okay. So the left-hand side is Y, the right-hand side is X. The next variable that's got arrows coming into it is question four. So that goes on the left. And it's comprised of question two and question 12. And that's it. So not a complex model. We've only got four squares. Um, but it's only two lines of code. So I always look for arrows coming in and define those in a path model. All right, and so that's how I have it down here. Actually, I did question four first, but it does not matter which one you would put first. Okay. So the eval.model, and this is a character string. Okay. So I've got question four, tilde, q12 plus two, question one, tilde, q4 plus 12. It doesn't matter what order I put the lines in, and it doesn't matter what order I put the x variables in. Now, let's look at how that prints out. So I just told it to print. So the slash in is a new line code. That is important. Okay. You have to have each equation on a new line. So you can't run those two together. Okay. So the new line encodes are important, but the spacing is not important. I could have like just crammed all of it together. I like to space them out because it's easier for me to read. Um, and I'm like particular, <laughs> but you don't have to have the spaces. Okay. You do have to have the new line codes. You can also use um, the hashtag symbol, the, dollar, the, the pound symbol, if you will, and the number sign in the code, and that is treated the same way it's treated in all R things are. It's considered a comment. So you can make comments within your notes, your model code. I don't tend to do that, but I had, except there are some types of models that I do just so that we can. Um, make sure sections are clear. So when we get to longer models, this kind of comment stuff is helpful. Now let's run the model. So we've built the model. Now let's run the model. And to do that, we're going to use the sim function. And there are a couple of functions in Levon. There's like Levon as a function, which I don't tend to use, sim as a function, and CFA as a function. And they're honestly all running something very similar underneath. But let's start with just using the sim function to make it clear that we're not doing a CFA. 
even though I think practically it would be okay if we use the CFA function, but let's do sim. And we're going to name it something like eval.output. So I have eval.data, eval.model, and eval.output. This just helps me keep them straight, which one's which. The default estimator in Levon is normal theory maximum likelihood, but you can do question mark sim to learn more about all of the options. And there are a lot of arguments that you can specify, and mostly the defaults are good, especially as you're learning. Minimum two things to define. Okay. The model, okay, you always have to define a model. Okay. So model is our eval model, and the data in some form. So our data is eval data. All right, let's summarize the model. So the nice thing, the simplest thing to do is to do summary. Okay, I love the summary function. It's so fancy, it does everything. And let's see, okay. So we've got maximum likelihood. It actually said it's estimating six parameters, which is not what we estimated a minute ago. Okay. But check this out. The degrees of freedom are one. So what happened? <laughs> Where did they go? <laughs> right? So I said, if you back up, this is this is one thing I, I don't love about path models, is there it's a little um, obtuse. Okay, let me back up. I said we got four regression, two error variances, two regular variances, and a covariance. If you excuse my typo, we have one degree of freedom. Okay. Now, when I look at the summary here, I have one degree of freedom. So I got that part right. But it said that it estimated six things. What happened? Right. So there are four regression coefficients, one, two, three, four, two error variances, and that's all it's showing you. Okay. It still estimated the two regular variances for exogenous variables and that covariance. It just doesn't show them to you in the output. I f actually forget. There's a way to force it to show you this. I think it's parameter estimates. I think we'll look in a, in a minute um, to see all of those, but I, that's one thing I don't like about path models is this is definitely a misnomer because it's actually estimating nine different numbers, which is how it ends up with nine degrees with one <laughs> degree of freedom. Phew. Okay. Now what else is in here? Okay. The test statistic, this is our, um, chi square value. And we're going to talk more about chi-square and fit statistics next time. Okay. And then all of our estimates. But that's it. This is not a very good summary. So let's talk about how to make the summary a little bit better. Because that default output only includes the sample size. The estimator, which we picked the normal information, maximum likelihood. The minimum function test statistic, which is a chi-square value, degrees of freedom, and its p-value the unstandardized parameter estimates. Those are labeled here under estimate. Okay, their standard error, their z-score, and their p-value. And that's it. So, so much more we could learn. So we're actually going to mostly, I'm going to tell you to do it this way all year, is to use three extra options. There are more than this, but these are the good three. So a uh, summary of our eval output, standardized equals true. So show me both solutions. I want the unstandardized and the standardized solution. Fit dot measures. Uh, these, there's a, uh, another function just called fit measures with no dot. So hang on to that dot. I did this earlier and I couldn't figure out what I was doing wrong. So fit dot measures okay, equals true. Okay. So that we see more fit statistics. So we talked about fit statistics for EFA, like um, the RAMC, the root mean squared error approximation, the um, CFI and TLI, the Tucker Lewis. We're going to cover those in the next class in too much detail. So uh, we'll mostly ignore them right now, but we want to see them. And it shows you kind of the most popular ones. And I'll show you how to get all of them.
So everything we're going to talk about in the next lecture you can find, but it's not default. So fit measures here shows you a, a subset of them, if you will. And then R squared equals true to get R squared multiple correlations. This is a good set, but it does make the output a lot longer. So it's going to show us the model that you designed, what's called the baseline model, where everything's unrelated. More on that next time. Uh, two of the big goodness of fit indices, so the CFI and the TLI, we've seen those before in our EFA section. This one's negative, that's no good. Um, two model comparison, or three, I'm sorry, model comparison indices, uh, our RIMC, our SRMR, so these are the most popular ones that you might see published in a journal. Then we get down here, doo -doo -doo -doo, and we get the estimates. Dog's doing her shake dance tonight. <laughs> okay. We still don't see those other estimates. So they're there, they're just not being printed. And so we've got our estimate here for our unstandardized solution, and then our standardized on the latent variable, more on that later, and our completely standardized solution. If I'm going to look at a standardized solution, it's going to be this last column over here. So I could tell you that the strongest two predictors are question two and question four. Are you quite done? It's a zoo in here. Okay, so how do I interpret these? Well, remember that this is Y. So question 12 predicts question 4. Okay, it is significant. And for every one point increase in question 12, this is a course I wanted to take, we get a 0.10 increase in question 4, which is on fair grading. And I think I've said that model correctly. <laughs> um, and then for this one, it's much stronger, right? So for every one point increase in question 2, uh, stuff is clear and organized, I get almost a half a point in question 4, it's fair grading. So that makes a little bit of sense. For overall evaluation, if it's a course you wanted to take, your overall evaluation goes up 0.26 points. If the grading is fair, you actually get a bigger bump in the overall evaluation. So what's more important, them wanting to take it or them thinking the grading is fair? The argument here is the grading is fair. And so we interpret these just like B coefficients. Are my error variances large? Nope, doing good. Okay, so large, this is a one to five scale. These are pretty normal. Okay. And so I always look at the estimate here, or because this is the variance itself, and this is the standard error on the variance, so you really want to look here. Um, I mostly ignore the z-scores on these because <laughs> they just get like astronomically large kind of quickly. Down here we have our R squared values. These are R squared multiple correlations. So I am predicting half. These are already squared. So this is about half of the variance in um, fair grading. And um, with only two variables, I'm really predicting like 60% of the variance in overall evaluation. So doing pretty good. The other thing we want to do is create a picture. Okay. So sometimes when I when I'm converting these from like picture format to code, I can screw up. Okay. So you want to know that you've actually modeled what you intended to model. And that's easy when the plot is or the the number of variables is small. If you have 100 if you have a bunch of variables, these graphs are not the greatest because it just there's not enough space to draw them in basically. But for a small number of variables, simplot's pretty fantastic. So the function is simpaths. So we do eval.output. I think this runs on qplot in the background. Don't quote me on that, but I'm pretty sure. And then a couple of arguments that I will ask you to do all the time. The first one is what labels? What labels is what number do I plop down on the line? 
And so we can do this as PAR for parameter estimates or STD for standardized estimates. And you can do either one. Sometimes I say which one, but in this model I did this unstandardized estimates. My favorite function, which is edge label CEX, because it makes the numbers larger, <laughs> so you can read it. <laughs> Layout here can be a bunch of different options. Tree, circle, spring, tree two, circle two, go bonkers, figure out which one is the best. And that's about all the control. You can actually tell it where to plot them, but it, it's like way over my head sometimes. Um, but now, can I tell what I meant to diagram? Right. So question one is predicted by question 12 and four. So that looks good. Question 12 also predicts question four and then question two out here to four. So it looks like I converted this correctly. And now here's where those extra parameters are. You can see the covariance here between these two. If I made this the standardized solution, I would see what the correlation is between these two. So that's where that sneaky one is. And there are variances on these two. So these are the three parameters that are not listed in the output. And our four regression coefficients and our two error variances, which adds up to nine. Let's do one more example. And specifically, I want to show you how to do this without real data. So you don't actually have to have the data because it's um, SIM is a um, analysis of variances. So all I really need is the covariance or a correlation matrix. Okay. So as long as you have one of those two things, more than likely you have the correlation matrix more than anything else, you can still run the analysis. However, if you have the raw data, use the raw data because you'll have less problems. Don't convert to a correlation matrix first if you have the raw data. Just go with the raw data. And so a lot of our examples that we'll do this semester are from textbooks where they printed the correlation matrix. So the reason that we're using this function so much is just out of convenience um, but it's nice because somebody uh, like at least in academic papers the argument is that if you're printing a structural equation model you should always at least include the correlation matrix so that people can reproduce your work or at least that's my review every time I give I look at one of these models but to do that if you are typing it in right there's this cool function, lab matrix lower to full, where you type in the lower half of a correlation triangle and it makes it the full correlation matrix for you. And so you can do this in covariance or correlation. And if it has ones down the diagonal, it figures out that it's correlation. And so here's our correlation matrix. But when I enter this manually, I do have to name these things myself. So we're just going to call it X123 and Y because it's a made-up example. In the uh, examples that you'll see in the um, practice assignments are real examples, so they have real names. But they've got to have those variables have to have names, or you can't draw them. And so the point of this is to show you another model. Okay, here's some comments. And I really want to talk here about um, giving the pass a, a label. So we'll use this in next week's example, but we'll also use this when we're trying to fix identification problems. Okay. So I can put this little label here in front of any very, I wouldn't put it in front of Y, but I guess I could. Um, any estimated path. Okay. So it's going to estimate us. This is a very simple, this is just regression. <laughs> Right? This is uh, y is, is x plus x plus x, okay? which I can analyze in a Levon format. It doesn't make a lot of sense, but I can. Um, where I have three different slope values, and I'm just giving them names, a, b, c. Okay? That is advantageous when you're going to do mediation models, which is the example we'll do next week. Or you are, this is how grouped models work. So it allows you to control group one is A and group two is B. So they're estimated as different things. And equality constraints. So I, if I say that X1 is A and X2 is A, it will actually force them to be the same estimate by averaging them, basically. The second one here is how, showing you how to set a variable's variance. 
So in this case, I'm just labeling it as Z. I haven't given it a number, but I could set it to a specific number. In this model, that would not be a very good idea, but um, in models where we're having problems with Haywood cases, this is very useful notation because we can tell a variable to not have a negative variance by saying Y tilde tilde equals, you know, essentially uh, 0.2 times Y. But until you get used to the fact that this is like a times, a multiplication, it kind of looks like you're um, adding some extra estimate, but really you're just giving the estimate a label. So let's look at that. So fake made up numbers here, but the important thing to notice is here. So instead of saying data equals, right, so the data argument is for full data sets. We're going to instead say sample.cove. Now it's always sample.cove. There might be a sample.core in there, but they work. This has always worked fine for me because if the matrix has ones in the diagonal, it's correlation matrix, right? If they don't, then it's a covariance matrix. So sample.cove equals our regression matrix. If you do not give it a full data set, you have to tell it how many people there are. So sample knobs, which just kind of makes me laugh as well, for sample in observations or sample size. In this case, is a made up thousand. So let's see what happens. All right. All right. This gave us a perfect model, so a perfect degrees of freedom. So this is a just identified model, which is no good. Right, we want them to be more degrees of freedom than this. And so all of our fit indices will also be perfect. So this is why you can't have a model with zero degrees of freedom, but for this demonstration, it is pretty good. Okay. Um, in a model that is only regression, you do have a what's called a perfect fit. Okay. That doesn't mean that the model is perfect. It means that you just don't have any degrees of freedom. Um, but that, that happens because I have a small number of variables and uh, just kind of a regression. Uh, oops, back up. Apologies. So what happened by labeling those variables? So this is what where it went. Okay. So it just adds this little label to them, like you labeled this one A, you labeled this one B. If we wanted to add a degree of freedom and make it a not perfect um, model, we could set two of them to A. It would force those estimates to be the same, so it would actually average these two together. That's really handy, but if you had a situation where two variables predicted and one didn't, and you force them to be the same, you would be kind of making a mess. And so that's why more measured variables is always better. All right. And I can make a pretty picture of that, and here is why we don't have any degrees of freedom okay? because it looks like we're only estimating four numbers. Right? I'm estimating four parameters and I have four variables, so that's 10 possible degrees of freedom. How did I end up with none? Right? There are only four down here, one, two, three, four. Well, again, this will be the third time's a charm. All of the exogenous variables get a covariance between them if they're exogenous only. So it actually is adding, you know, our four that we had, one, five, six, seven for the um, variances for the exogenous variables, eight, nine, ten for the covariances between them. And this is what I mean by it's unexpected. That those, you know, I'm only really estimating four things. Well, no, there's a bunch of other stuff in the background that you don't see. This is why I love also making diagrams, because it's more explicit now, right? much more obvious. Uh, and I think I still set these to par. <laughs> All right. And they, they're, these are estimated as one because this is a covariance, uh, correlation matrix that we put in. Okay. So when you put in a correlation matrix, I think you pretty much always get the standardized solution. Yeah. So notice here how the estimate and the standardized all are the same. That's because you gave it standardized data. If you have the covariance matrix, you can actually get both. But if you give it standardized data, you get the standardized data back. All right. So do I want to go for a mediation model? 
think a half. Hold on, what time is it? Yes, I think the first um, path example has mediation on it. So we should go through these real quick. Yes. All right. Couldn't remember. So I lied to you. We'll do mediation right now. <laughs> okay. So what is a mediation model? Okay. And so if you've never seen these before, they're a special type of regression that implies that there's a relationship between X and Y until I add some mediator variable M. Okay. And so when that third wheel comes into the equation, it diminishes the relationship between X and Y. So it reduces it closer to zero. So if it's negative, it's closer to zero. If it's positive, it gets closer to zero. Okay. Um, it doesn't enhance the relationship. That's moderation. Okay, so mediation is when it reduces or diminishes the relationship. Moderation is an interaction effect. Okay. You can do both, but mediation models are very easy to do in Lebon. Okay. And we can do that in regular regression or as a structural um, equation model. And so let's look at here. So from the Bojan book, I have this covariance matrix. So notice it doesn't have the ones die on the diagonal, so it's covariance. And I'm going to look at salary, school, and IQ. Okay. So I'm going to build a model that says that salary is predicted by um, school and IQ. Okay. But IQ is also predicted by school. If you're looking at, if you bought an old, uh, old version of the book, it's incorrect. So this is the correct version. Okay. So I'm saying here that IQ moderates the relationship, sorry, mediates, good grief, I've taught this a million times, mediates the relationship um, between schooling and salary. So yeah, my schooling predicts my salary, and the more schooling I have, the higher the salary usually, but there's this um, mediating effect of IQ. So people like Elon Musk, if you will. But specifically to get that mediation effect, to know like how much that reduction is or how much this indirect effect is, we have to add this little piece here. And so it's I and D and then this new operator. I think you can actually call it whatever you want here on the left-hand side, but this specific like kind of reminds me of like a sideways punisher <laughs> where you have a colon and an equals. Uh, it's a special type of operator that allows us to define this B times C effect. Okay. So you multiply. Um, this is in a mediation model, the A path and the B path. I did not label these very well, but um, we can multiply those by each other, and that will tell us how much um, school to IQ to salary is versus just school to salary. Okay. So how much does it go through this other path? So I always think about mediation as like a detour. So yeah, there's a direct path, but maybe the detour is faster. So how much better is the detour? Okay. How much does it diminish my drive time? Okay. So we're going to analyze the model, same way we've been doing. So sample cove, sample observations, 300, I made up data. And then let's see. Well, it's, again, a um, just identified model, so our fit indices are no good. But what's cool, you know, it gives us all the paths here, is it will actually show you this defined parameter down here. Okay. So we can see how much that mediation effect is. Okay. And generally, you look at the um, unstandardized estimate here, and you just want to know if that's different from zero. It can be positive, it can be negative, but it is it different from zero? And yeah, it is, because this data is fake. <laughs> now, the, the salary and the IQ estimates for variance are really large here, but that's in the scale of the data, so it makes sense. And you can always kind of look over here at this fully standardized solution, and if they aren't too crazy huge, then you're probably okay. So even though these are large, that's within the scale of the data, so it makes a lot of sense. And these estimates here, again, make sense within that scaling. Okay. So that's just really what I wanted to show you. Now, mediation model picture is always a triangle. Okay. And so we're trying to predict salary here, where 
Um, the direct relationship is like my school predicts my salary. The indirect relationship would be like schooling actually is related to IQ, right, which then predicts my salary. And that's the basic gist of a mediation model is that um, that direct relationship is diminished by adding this indirect path. How much was it diminished? This amount. Okay. Now I should label these better because it's actually the A times B. I just didn't label them. If you look ever look at mediation pictures, you'll talk about how it's A times B, but I just, the labels aren't great because it's a book example. <clears throat> All right, that's where we're going to stop is that fit indices for the evening, and we'll start there on our next lecture.